Welcome to the third installment on the subject of Shabbat, a practical conclusion. I'm Rod Bryant with the YPS Great Project to bring the knowledge of the Noahide Mitzvahs and Practical Lifestyle course to the nations. And we are excited to say that there are over 180 some odd people enrolled now and probably by the time this sits here, this has been going on for about five weeks now. Uh, I can imagine thousands will be enrolled in the next couple of years from all over the world. Welcome to the uh, the great classroom of the internet, welcoming all Noahites from all over the world. The last class, we dealt with the Shabbat and the patriarchs, and to try to answer that question, if the patriarchs were Noahide, then how did they observe the Shabbat? And what did that actually mean, and how does it translate down to us? As we find out, as we study these, these sections of the Talmud, etc., and the, the opinions of the sages, we probably garner more questions than answers at times, but the practical application is what we want to come to on the conclusion of Shabbat. Let's take uh, this and look at a summary of what the sources have taught us so far. Sanhedrin 58b cites Genesis 8.22, which prohibits all mankind from keeping Shabbat. The verse prohibits cessation from work for a 24-hour period. Now, prior to Sinai, the respite of Shabbat was for God alone, and at Sinai, the Jews were commanded to partake in the experience of Shabbat at a sign of their unique status. Rashi, Radbaz, and Rav Moshe Feinstein commenting on the Rambam, states, For the sake of this prohibition, it does not make difference as to why one rests for the entire day. Even if one sets aside an entire day only to recuperate from work, he still transgresses. Radbads clarifies this, saying, Though this is only if one establishes a regular fixed day, to take an occasional day off is permitted. Midrash Rabbah explains that the prohibition of non-Jewish observance of Shabbat takes a special poignancy after the giving of the Torah. The Jews were commanded at Sinai to partake of the divine rest of Shabbat as a sign of their covenant. Anyone else who tries to do is interposing between God and Israel. The patriarchs, on the other hand, we are taught that they kept the Torah. However, both the nature of their observance and identity as Noahides are not clear to us enough for us to really draw a practical conclusion. Additionally, there is a principle that we do not learn from Halakha that is practiced from the actions of the patriarchs. Binyan Zion when the verse states, when the verse in Genesis prohibits the observance of Shabbat by prohibiting the cessation of labor, it is not using the Torah definition of labor. Instead, it is using the colloquial definition of labor. From here, it would appear that a non-Jew may keep Shabbat by observing the Jewish definition of the sabbatical labor. Yet many abstain from the colloquial definition of labor. This interpretation does not seem to be relied upon by many of the above-cited authorities who imply that even the Jewish definition of labor is prohibited for non-Jews. The Binyan also contradicts the Midrash understanding of the Jewish Shabbat as a unique sign between God and Israel. Maimonides states in Halchot's Melachim 10.9, a non-Jew who delves into Torah is obligated to die. They only should be involved in the study of their seven commandments. Similarly, a non-Jew who rests even on the weekday, observing that day similarly to a Shabbat, is obligated to die. Needless to say, this is also the case if he creates a festival for himself. Now, in the Torah, the Hebrew word for Shabbat may refer to the se seventh day, actually, or any day upon which labor is prohibited by the Torah. This would include festivals. The Radbaz quotes Rashi, who writes that any kind of rest for any reason should be prohibited. However, the Radbaz adds, this is if he establishes a day of rest, however, 
occasional cessation from labor is not prohibited. Now, the general rule governing these matters is this. They may not obligate a new religion or create or, or, or perform a mitzvah for themselves based on their own reasoning. Either convert and accept all the mitzvahs or uphold their commandments without adding or detracting from them. That is the bottom line issue for those who come out of the nations. Maimonides explains that the reason for the prohibition of Shabbat observances by non-Jews is found in Kedushi Dat, originating a new religion, discussing a length and a prior lesson, Kedushi Dat, would preclude Noahides from observing Shabbat by refraining from the Jewish definition of labor, the 39 Melachot. If a Gentile delves into Torah and Shabbat or innovates a religious practice, he is beaten, punished, and informed he is to be obligated to die for his actions. Now remember in previous classes, there, there's a caveat to this. Number one, it had to be in the land during the time of the Sanhedrin and the temple. Second, it had to involve those people that were living alongside the Jewish people. It does not have anything to do with people outside of the land, nor in present day. However, continuing on, he is not exactly executed. Harav Hagaon, Moshe Feinstein, and Rabbi uh, Moshe Feinstein explains that the Shi Dat is a general prohibition against Noahides adopting Jewish practices as religious observance. However, the prohibition of observing Shabbat and the structures of Torah study are singled out by Maimonides due to their severity. In conclusion, according to the Binyan Zion, Noahides may not establish any 24-hour period as a time of rest for work. By work, we mean whatever is colloquially defined as work. According to Maimonides, Noahides may also not observe Shabbat by refraining from the Jewish definition of the work, or the 39 Melachot. This would be Kedushidat. Kedushidat would also prohibit Noahides from making Shabbat in any way by using Jewish rituals, such as lighting candles, making Kiddush, uh, making a blessing for bread, etc., loaves, etc., the conclusion of the Pashkim is, therefore, that Noahides may not observe Shabbat in any way by refraining from work for a 24-hour period or by adopting Jewish rituals. Noahides may not either establish a regular 24-hour period of rest, even for non-Jewish reasons. This is also the conclusion of Rav Moshe Weiner of the Divine Code. Now, with that being said, it must be understood that there is nothing prohibiting a Noahide from marking an occasion with a remembrance or memorial because this is what the Jewish people do. There is a big difference and we'll define it in a moment. Let's talk about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. Now, a, a Noahide has two options now as how to deal with the question of labor on Shabbat, etc. We may either take a liberal approach, which follows only the strict letter of the law, or may take a pious conservative approach, acknowledging both the spirit and the letter of the law. The letter of the law is that the Noahide may not commemorate Shabbat by regularly refraining from work on, on an entire day. It does matter if one rests from daybreak to daybreak or from nightfall to nightfall. He should not refrain from a colloquial definition of work. However, a Noahide may refrain from labor using the Jewish definition of work. That is, provided that he has not observed uh, all the uh, Jewish prohibitions of labor. He should turn on a light or make a fire, right? do something that would be to do what is prohibited by Jews. Otherwise, he would be transgressing the prohibition of observing the Shabbat, which means a person who is a non-Jew, a Noahide, who have rejected Shituv, rejected idolatry, who believes in one true God, is a monotheist. He, too, can remember the Shabbat not observe it in the sense of an Orthodox Jew. I think sometimes for the Noahide, you would tend to use the word, I observe the Shabbat. But when an Orthodox Jew hears, I observe the Shabbat, they are hearing, I observe the Shabbat as an Orthodox Jew. And, and that's not true. And I don't personally know of any, or if there are many, pious non-Jews that quote-unquote observe the Shabbat 
And when they say observe, and this is for the education of the Jews that will watch this pro, uh, this this teaching, for those who, who are not Jews and would say, I observe the Shabbat, they are literally talking about, I honor, revere, I set aside, remember this day as a special day for the Jewish people, that God has made a covenant with the Jewish people, and we, in recognition as the Noahides, uh, believe that God has appointed them to do this. There's nothing wrong with this. We should keep in mind that this uh, observance of Shabbat, however, is uh, meaningless. Observance of Shabbat means resting from the 39 labors defined at Sinai. The purpose in a Noahide doing one of the prohibited labors is that it does not run afoul in prohibition of observing the Shabbat, that his one prohibited labor invalidates the entire observance. Therefore, despite resting for the whole day, he uh, never actually kept Shabbat anyway. The idea is this. Let me try to set this straight. A non-Jew who is a pious non-Jew who observes the Shabbat's vote, who uh, who honors the Shabbat by declaring this day is the seventh day of rest that God has given his people, that use that time to spend with family, to, to study, to have family meals, whatever it may be, there's no problem at all for you. There's no issue. The issue is when you attempt to do the whole Shabbat as a Orthodox Jew would observe it. It's not appropriate, but second of all, it's not even observing the Shabbat. If you're not Jewish, there's no way for you to observe the Shabbat fully. It's, it's just going to be the fly in the ointment. The idea is if you're not observing the Shabbat, what are you doing? And that is uh, understand the difference between acknowledging and observing. As we mentioned earlier, God only asked Israel to share in the Shabbat. A Noahite is some way imposing his will upon God. As we saw in earlier lessons, this is a severe issue. Although this mode of behavior is in step with the letter of the law, it fails to acknowledge the spirit of law. It is a liberal approach to Torah, law, and Noahidism. One who seeks to go beyond the letter of the law is a matter of piety, will refrain from any observance of Shabbat. A pious God-fearer, religious Noahide, will not attempt to observe the Shabbat in any way by resting. A Noahide who imitates Jewish observance on Shabbat is less observant Noahide than one does not observe Shabbat at all. Now the question is, is what will you do? Let's talk about observance versus acknowledgement. Until now, we have only discussed the observance of Shabbat by observance. However, we mean refraining from the labor or imitating other Jewish Shabbat obligations. However, this prohibition does not preclude Noahides from having a positive, meaningful connection with Shabbat. In short, Noahides may not observe the Shabbat as a Orthodox Jew, but may certainly acknowledge and commemorate Shabbat. In fact, Noahides may even be required to acknowledge Shabbat. And there are plenty of Pashka who say that as well. The Midrash says that uh, a man by the name of Tarnas Rufus approached Rabbi Akiva, and he said, ask Rabbi Akiva, from where can you prove to me that God wished to honor the seventh day? Rabbi Akiva responded, verify it with necromancy, or verify it, because a spirit will ascend on any day of the week except for Shabbat. Verify it with the spirit of your father. Tarnas Rufus checked the veracity of Rabbi Akiva's claim with the spirit of his own father. His father's spirit ascended upon the every day of the week except Shabbat. Tar Ternus Rufus again uh, raised his father and asked him, Father, is it possible that you became a Jew after you died, that you observed the Shabbat? Why did you ascend every day of the week but not ascend on Shabbat? He, that is uh, Ternus Rufus' father, answered him saying, Anyone who does not willfully observe the Shabbat among the living is forced to do among the dead. The Maharzu explains that the spirit of Tur uh, Turnus Rufus' father could not mean that non-Jews must observe Shabbat. Rather, it means that any non-Jew who denies the significance of Shabbat will be forced to do among the dead. What does it mean, forced to do among the dead? The Midrash goes on and explains that the wicked are punished by the fires of Gehonim every day of the week, but are given respite on Shabbat. One who denies the existence and significance of Shabbat, even a non-Jew, will apparently be held accountable. 
Furthermore, Noahide's acknowledgement of Shabbat goes back to the beginning of creation. Fascinating midrash about Adam and uh, Chayim and the composition of Psalm 92. Adam met Chayim and asked him, what happened? What was your judgment? Chayim replied, I repented, and it was mitigated. Adam began slapping his own face and cried out, such is the power of repentance, and I didn't know it? Adam immediately arose and declared, Mizmor Shir Layom HaShabbat, a psalm of song for Shabbat. In Psalm 92, recited by Adam for Shabbat, only mentions Shabbat in its opening. It then goes on to praise God's deeds in creation, uh, curiously contrasting the permanence of his deeds with the temporary follies of the wicked, and then concludes with the praises of the righteous man. What is the connection between the idea of tshuva, repentance, temporary prospering of the wicked, and the Shabbat? Well, speaking with Cain, Adam realized the power of repentance and marveled at its greatness. Tshuva is a great creation for which Adam praises God. God is also praised for his incredible kindness. He does not execute judgment immediately. Rather, he waits allowing transgressors time to either do tshuva or lose themselves further. Alternatively, Adam also realized that this world is a place of the finite recompense. Here a person is rewarded for the minority of his deeds. Therefore, the wicked are often rewarded for their few mitzvahs, while the righteous are often punished for their few sins. But what does this all have to do with Shabbat? When God rested on the Shabbat, he beheld the goodness of his creation. He saw that it was well suited for his purpose. But two, Adam, in his revelation, suddenly understood the greatness of God and his world and the incredible potential that was offered. In that revelation, he saw the big plan. He understood the nature of reward and punishment, the fate of the wicked, and the ultimate reward of the righteous. He understood his purpose and how the world was was designed for it. Rashi understands this psalm as primarily an acknowledgement of the world to come, the ultimate Shabbat. We see that Adam's relationship to Shabbat was not of rest. It was a relationship of epiphany, a day of awakening and realization. This is the Noahide relationship to Shabbat. It is therefore appropriate. To base the Noahide acknowledgement of Shabbat on Psalm 92 and Adam's epiphany. In this way, Noahides are following the way of Adam, to whom the Noahide laws are commanded. Now, we can talk about Shabbat prayer and service in the home, and I'm going to tell you there is not a definitive answer on this. However, we will skim through a couple of generalities so that you can know where to go. There is still not a defined liturgy for the B'nai Noach for the service. But as we know before, we are challenged with the ideas that says that the B'nai Noach should not, what you call, adapt Torah practices for Shabbat uh, for the non-Jew. Can they light candles? Well, yes, they can light candles, but are they restricted by the hours or the time of lighting the candles? Some would say no. Others would say if you're going to light candles, make sure that you light it within the time frame that it's supposed to be lit. Others will say, well, you don't light two candles because that is only prescribed by the Jewish woman, that you can light multiple candles or you can light one candle. Uh, There are others who say that uh, only the woman is to give the the Shabbat bracha. And for Noahides, it can be the man or the woman, at least one person in the household. Uh, The question is, is what kind of blessing? Some say that you should not do uh, the blessing over the wine or the bread, that you should do some other blessing. This all can be a bit confusing and unsettling because you don't know where to exactly land. However, in the spirit of following after or acknowledging Shabbat, recognizing that it is a a day of repentance, renewal, and epiphany, a revelation before God, then this time should be entered in with that same type of prayer. Even if it's a personal prayer or you decide to recite a prayer uh, from the Jewish prayer book, Whatever you feel like doing, you do. I would best consult your rabbi, though, or a consulting rabbi nearby to find out exactly the wording that you should use. 
There are psalms that you can read and pray after uh, lighting a candle, maybe even the psalm that we just talked about. Nevertheless, uh, with, with that being said, as you mature and as the material becomes available, there will be proper liturgy and prayer books that will be established, God willing, and hopefully a prayer book that both the Noahide and Jew could read from equally. But once again, remembering, it's a very careful line for a Bene Noah to walk. And in no way do we want to discourage you from observing uh, or acknowledging Shabbat. If anything, we want to fan the flames for the Ben or Bat Noah, for the people of the nations who have accepted upon themselves the love of one God in the Torah and have truly repented from their idolatrous ways to join the Jewish people and join them in the way that Noahides can join. And that is acknowledge this great day that God has given the Jewish people and the day of rest that God has given the Jewish people. Acknowledge it through tshuva. Acknowledge it through study and for prayer. Acknowledge it through spending time with your family. And know that your life will be richer because you have acknowledged this great day of Shabbat. That concludes this class, and we'll see you next class.